thank you for coming to Zintak. <laughs> no, I'm improving my Danish. Uh, thank you, Thor. Well, Manaus was a, a, a very nice city in the, as far as I can remember, in the 50s, at the end of the 50s, and at the beginning of the 60s. It was a town with 300,000 inhabitants, a small town in Brazil, and uh, with beautiful small rivers that we call <coughs> Igarapés. Igarapés, it's a, a, an Indian name for Tupi. That means uh, a, a narrow, a narrow river. There were eight, ten small rivers in the city, but in with beautiful squares and architecture Belle Epoque, so. Uh, the opera house, which is there. <laughs> I don't know if it was destroyed yesterday. <laughs> but there is a wonderful opera house and, uh, and many immigrants. This is my childhood was, uh, I, my friends were, as you said, were Brazilians, but uh, of several origins, yeah? from Lebanon and from Italians, but also from, from people of Manaus. But uh, from the 70s on, this, the city has been destroyed because of the free zone. I don't know how to say mm -hmm. yeah. if, the, if the, yeah. there to is boost a, economy, because no. Manaus in the rubber time, in the Belle Epoque, as you say, was <laughs> It was a city built on the wealth of rubber. And then when that declined, uh, about 40, 50 years ago, it was yeah. decided to make a, a free zone without taxes to attract uh, industry. Uh, yes. And uh, actually, Lego has a factory in, uh, in Manaus <coughs> building, uh, making Lego toys and stuff. A lot of factories in Manaus. And a lot of growth, but well, destruction. Today it's a two million inhabitants city. It's the, well, but it's a very miserable now city with many problems and all, most of the old buildings, La Belle Epoque were destroyed. So it's not my city anymore. I don't recognize the city of my childhood. But it's there in all your novels. It's, uh, this is, this yeah. is uh, uh, one of the, the, the core of the of the novels of two novels, I mean the destruction of of the of the city and of the the rainforest also uh, in the suburbs of Manaus. Now there is a scene in 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 Nash of the Amazon, so uh, that's why all paradise are lost, for mm. <laughs> in a sense, yeah. with a bang sometimes. <laughs> sometimes with a bang and sometimes with a whimper. Yes. Yes. Um, and um, in the spring of 1964, you were 11 years old, 11 and a half years old. And this is where the novel, this novel starts. And it's the time when the military seized power in Brazil in end of March, beginning of April 1964. How did you experience the, the military coup and the dictatorship as a child? Yeah, I, I have heard of this, of the coup d'etat uh, when my, my uncle was uh, arrested. He disappeared. And my grandmother cried and as, there was something wrong in my family. And I asked to my father, what's going on? He said, no. You will not understand now. <laughs> and, and then, uh, when I was in high school, I, I realized that uh, something had changed in, in, in Brazil. Brazil. And uh, this was my first, my first uh, 
say, vision of the of the coup d'état. But uh, in '64, there was no, there's not a such a big repression as in the '70s or at the end of the '60s. Mm. It grew worse and worse. Yes, it became worse and worse, and <clears throat> the idea of the first general of the dictatorship was not to <coughs> to be tough with with the op op opponents. Mm. But then there was a, a turning point inside the military <coughs> elite of the, the regime. Mm. And uh, well, after something is in the novel, yeah. what happened in Brazil and then in, in Chile and Argentina, all South America. But the novel doesn't deal directly with this question. No. It's another thing. It's, the, the, the regime, the coup d'etat, is, is like a background. Yes. A background. So yeah. It's not directly... Uh, but it begins at the same time, because these two boys meet each other in the schoolyard uh, when school resumes. Uh, after, I guess, school has been closed down during uh, the coup and then school uh, opens again and these two boys um, happen to be in the same class. We yeah. have Raimundo or Mundo and Lavo, who is the narr narrator. But, but Mundo is the protagonist. Who is Mundo? <laughs> This is a story of a friendship. And... Uh, in a certain sense, they, they are at the same time very different, but very, very similar, very close to each other. Uh, Mundo is a, a part of myself. <laughs> It's my other. That's, Mundo goes, he, he flees, he goes to, to Rio, to Berlin, to London. He, he wants to go away. From the provincial, provincial life, and I did it. When I was 15 years old, I, I, got out. I got out of my, my city alone. My father said to me, "Go, if you'd like to go," mm. and uh, I went to Brasilia. Horrible city at that time. Sad, <laughs> violent. Uh, and I lived two, two years in Brasilia, and um, I couldn't bear the city, the atmosphere, all the... So I went to Sao Paulo and lived 10 years, and became an architect, a very bad architect, in fact. <laughs> and uh, I left my profession and went to, to Madrid. And in Madrid, I started writing my first novel. It was important to, to see my country, uh, to get a distance of my, of my country. And uh, it was crucial for me. Otherwise, I, perhaps I, I would not have Uh, opportunity to write or to think or to uh, change my profession. No. It was very important to go away. Well, as many, many... I was not an, ex an exile. I was uh, an expatriate. But uh, problems happened mm. during the 70s in my, in my life. This, um, in one of the other novels, or either the brothers or orphans of El Dorado, someone says to his son, get out of the provinces, the provinces will destroy you, get out. Uh, that's what happened. And, and um, why did you stop being an architect, by the way? Well, my experience as an architect was terrible. <sighs> I made two projects that were totally transformed. 
One of them was a house, a beautiful, a nice house that became a Bordeaux, a brothel in Manaus. And the other one, the proprietor, the yeah. changed completely my my idea. And I like to at that time to work with with the social. I don't know how to say see habitação popular, social uh, popular. Uh, yeah, uh, enterprise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Build builds for uh, house for the yeah. people. Yeah, but uh, we couldn't make projects. No, no, because all the projects were very, very uh, small, the small houses, and we gave up. Not only me, but a part of my generation. Mm. But even today, the projects for the people of houses are are very, very bad, precarious, with no dignity. Mm. So, and I loved writing since I was 12 years old. Uh, even in Manaus, I, I wrote some poems uh, in Brasilia also. My first poem was published in the newspapers in Brasilia. And uh, in Sao Paulo, I wrote some such stories. Uh, I didn't publish them. I, I published a, a small, a small book, a poetry, a poem, a book of poetry. Mm. Uh, it was completely forgot. Thanks God, because it's, <laughs> it's not good. And uh, only in Europe, I started writing a novel. Mm. And no one can destroy like that, like they destroyed your houses. I guess you know. No one can alter th those projects or destroy them. Sometimes the editors. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Tina? <laughs> Tina, and Tina, the, no, not translator, my, but my editor in São Paulo. Uh, well, she's very, she's very nice, <laughs> uh, very, very smart, and uh, we have to talk with the editor. We have to change ideas, and uh, they. I, I think that the editor they they improve. The text mm. sometimes <laughs> <laughs> it depends uh, of the editor, but a good editor can can improve for sure your text, and it's important. Uh, all my books were were edited with my with my opinions also, mm. you know. Uh, and I remember that this book was a. 400 page book mm. and she told me it's too long you have to yeah. cut 50 60 page and I did and I did so you are lonely when you write for years but at the end you you you, you have to show your text to <laughs> to someone yeah. to our friends and to your enemies, sometimes, <laughs> to your editor, and uh, well, it has to go out there. You can't keep it forever. But um, there's a lot of you in uh, Raimundo, or a lot of Raimundo in you. Um, should we hear the beginning of the novel? And um, we've decided to do this in Portuguese and in Danish. So when I said before everything was going to be in English, that's not quite true. Because uh, uh, Milton Hatum will, will read the very first page of the novel in Portuguese. I think it's important that we all sort of get the feeling how he writes, what is his melody, what is his tone in his own language. And then I'll read uh, Tine Luke Prado's um, Danish translation. Okay. <coughs> Can you translate in Danish the the epigraph of Guimarães Rosa? Yeah. Please. Yeah. In Danish. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, some uh, as a little, um, you know, a little, not epitaph, but a little, uh, a little motto, epigraph. Yes, a little epigraph, a motto in the beginning of the book is a quotation from the great author uh, Guimarães Rosa. Uh, Jeg kommer fra min føde egen. Jeg kommer andet sted fra. 
Um, and you will say that too this, in Portuguese? Yeah. Oh, it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> eu sou de onde eu nasci, sou de outros lugares. There are novels about this. Mm -hmm. é, li a carta de mundo num bar do Beco das Cancelas, onde encontrei refúgio contra o rebuliço do centro do Rio e as discussões sobre o destino do país. Uma carta sem data, escrita numa clínica de Copacabana, aos solavancos e com uma caligrafia miúda e trêmula que revelava a dor do meu amigo. Pensei em reescrever minha vida de trás para frente, de ponta cabeça, mas não posso. Mal consigo rabiscar, as palavras são manchas no papel e escrever é quase um milagre. Sinto no corpo o suor da agonia. É o que se lê pouco antes do fim. Na margem da última página, estas palavras, meia-noite e pouco. Talvez ele tenha morrido naquela madrugada, mas eu não quis saber a data nem a hora. Detalhes que não interessavam. Uns 20 anos depois, a história de mundo me vem à memória com a força de um fogo escondido pela infância e pela juventude. Ainda guardo seu caderno com desenhos e anotações e os esboços de várias obras inacabadas, feitas no Brasil e na Europa, na vida a deriva que se lançou sem medo, como se quisesse se rasgar por dentro e repetisse a cada minuto a frase que enviou para mim no cartão postal de Londres. Ou a obediência estúpida, ou a revolta. Eu li esse brevet de Mundo por um bar em um lille sidegade em Cancelas, onde eu havia sido tilflugt por de gadeuroligheder e stridigheder om landets fremtid, que se sig i Rio. Brevet var uden dato og skrevet på en klinik i Copacabana med den lille rystende håndskrift, der røbede, hvor dårligt min ven havde det. Jeg tænkte på at skrive mit liv om, forfra og bagfra, fra ende til anden, men jeg kan ikke. Jeg kan knap krasse noget ned, ordene bliver til klatter på papiret, det at skrive er næsten et mirakel. Jeg mærker angsten sved over hele kroppen, det er, hvad jeg læste i slutningen af brevet. Ude i marken på den sidste side står ordene, lidt over midnat. Han kan være død ved daggry samme dag, men jeg ønskede hverken at kende datoen eller tidspunktet. Det var blot ligegyldige detaljer. Nu 20 år senere vender minderne om Mundus historie tilbage som en brændende ild, fortrængt af barndom og ungdom. Jeg har stadig hans hæfte med tegninger, notater og skitser til de mange uafsluttede værker, han tegnede i Brasilien og i Europa i løbet af det omflakkende liv, han frygtløst kastede sig ud i, som om han ville sønderrive sig selv indefra. Igen og igen gentog han den sætning, han skrev til mig på et postkort fra London. Valget står mellem stupid lydighed eller oprør. As you see, it's better in Danish. <laughs> <laughs> These two um, characters, Labo is a narrator, but as in your other novels, I've noticed often the narrator is... Um, is a character who is, you know, a little to the side, uh, not 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 so important a character, and and not so important in the family. He he has a a minor position in some way, and and uh, relates uh, tells about things uh, going on. But Mundo is is a protagonist, and he is an artist. He starts out drawing in school, draws caricatures of the um, of the teachers, and. Um, goes on to become a, a painter and a, an artist. And um, like you, went to Spain and to Paris uh, in the late 70s, the 80s. Um, you went to the Mundo, <laughs> and his name is Mundo. Um, is there a double uh, double meaning uh, there? Because his name is World also. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. But this aspiration to to be a painter and an artist was <clears throat> was suffocated by his father mm. by his father and by the fatherland yeah. by the this political situation yeah. and uh, there is no uh, it's a, a a tragic destiny yeah. in fact but all the novels have a, have a tragic destiny yeah. 
and uh, and the other one, the, the the main narrator is a becomes a lawyer, a, a major lawyer in the province, in the provincial life. But he writes the story. Mm. He writes the story. He has the memory. Uh, the main problem, I think, that not not only with this novel, all all the novels I wrote is is how to how to deal with the experience and language. This for me is a, is a, is a big challenge. Uh, how my, my own experience of, of life, of reading, becomes a, a language. How memories become language. This is for me the very, very important, the most important thing. Because memory is just like imagination. There's no there's not such a difference between <laughs> memory and imagination. I just read Proust, where memory begins and where imagination ends. It's all mixed up. And, uh, and I could not write about recent events. It would be impossible, because I'm not a journalist. Mm to write about circumstances. So you have to, to wait the time. Yeah. yeah. This novel yes. ends in the early 80s, I guess, doesn't it? Or the mid 80s, approximately. It takes a place over 20 years, more yeah. or less. The, yeah. the, the president novel, The Brothers, takes place from about 1945 to 1964, to the military coup. And the most recent one, uh, Orphans of El Dorado, is from about 1910 to 19... Second World War. Yeah, to 1940. So you've actually described most of the history of Brazil in the 20th century um, in, in these three novels. Uh, but as you say, it, it can't be recent events. It has to be history memories, uh, myths, um, all this. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, like, just like the, the, the verse of Odin's uh, memory, you have the key. Mm. And uh, there's a memory of the experience that is important for me. <gasps> but when you become old, <laughs> 90s, I can't, <laughs> now, <laughs> I can't write about the 90s and the 80s, 90s. And, uh, but the number of books is not important. It's not, not very important. If you write, <laughs> to write ever, I, I have a friend in Brazil that he writes a book each year. Mm. And he asked me, did you, did you read my book, which one? You publish. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to read one of them, and you just finish another one. And uh, why such a uh, anxiety? Mm. And uh, I remember that Ba Holland Bart, when Maurice Nadeau, uh, the critic, mm -hmm. French critic, uh, he wrote the history of sur surrealism, asked, asked Holland Bart about the crisis of literature. But, but, but said, there is no cries of litter. There are too much books. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> if we when we go back to the title of the novel for a moment, uh, The Ashes. Yeah. Sinsich du Nord, or Ashes of uh, the Amazon. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in, in ashes, uh, but there are some some physical ashes in the in the book uh, too. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what ashes are we talking about? This afternoon, I've wrote, I've, read, uh, I've written about the title yeah? in English, yeah. in bad in English, of course. Uh, I wrote. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes you discover the book you want to write when you find the title of the narrative. To some extent, that was, that was what happened with Cinzas do Norte, which literally means Ashes of the North. 
the north of the original Portuguese title alludes to the Amazon region, but also to the course and destiny of the characters. In other words, it alludes to a spinning compass, to the disorientation of various lives and their tragic destinies, to paralyze through frustration or impasse. Lives turned to ashes. So the the lives of the, the characters that that uh, of a, the lives of the characters a part of the rainforest. There is a scene of <gasps> burning mm. the, in the seventies, and uh, well, the, ironically, the north is a, is the contrary. The, is a kind of disorientation. <laughs> Mm. Of the of the lives of the, the itinerary of the lives. So there's no the compass doesn't work really. Yes, yeah. it's it's a, it's a moral story of my of uh, of my generation. Yeah. In fact, yeah. it was hard to be artist in Brazil at that time. It was hard to write, to publish, to because of the censorship. But I think that the novel uh, goes beyond the the historical frame. It's, in fact, it's a familiar drama. Mm. That's what I want to write. Yeah. Yes, because uh, it's also the destruction of a family, the, the yeah. fall of the house of, uh, of, um, of Janu and uh, Raimundo. Uh, yeah, the fall of a family. To tell a something that's true, was true for me, because yeah. which is the true of literature, it's not the truth of science. Not even of psychoanalysis, which is very different. There, there is a link between psychoanalysis and literature, of course. But psychoanalysis tries to explain everything, and the novel cannot explain. Mm -hmm. It should make questions, yeah. and uh, and it's a story of a desire, a desire that's not, uh, it's not. Uh, completed, it's not realized. So the novel, in fact, is a story of a desire that cannot, cannot happen. <laughs> there is an evil in Jabu mm. somewhere to interrupt the course of the life. In the novel, not in life, of mm -hmm. course. <laughs> and there's a lot of tension in the family, there's a lot of tension between father and son uh, because uh, the son is a great disappointment to his father. Um, this goes for some of the other books also. In, in Orphans of El Dorado, the, um, the protagonist uh, causes, well, his mother dies in childbed when he's born. So he's the cause of his mother's death and uh, his father never stops letting him feel that he killed his mother. Every day he makes him feel that you're the cause of my wife's death, you're the cause of your mother's death. Here, uh, 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 Mundo, to his father, Janu, is one big disappointment. He's a mistake, an error, There's all this art uh, rubbish, wanting to become an artist. Uh, it's one big disappointment, and of course, the father is a disappointment to, to Mundo. He says, it's not natural that a father should love his dog more than his own son. But I guess he does. He, he loves his dog more. But it's not autobiographical. No, no. No. I never, <laughs> no, I never said that. <laughs> no, but you look at me as if my... No, 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 no. I remember my poor father, my mother. <laughs> I'm, no, it's not. I'm not talking about my father either. <laughs> <laughs> Something is autobiographical, but, but not... Slightly. Slightly. We have to invent our... Biography, in fact, mm. that's a good idea. It's never too late. That's a novel. It's, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. There's a saying that yeah. goes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but but uh, but I mean, uh, fathers and sons is there in, in in several of your novels, right? It's a, it's a classic. It is subject of literature. Yeah, 
from Balzac, from Flaubert, from uh, the Russian writers, the Père Goriot, mm. yeah. uh, the Balzac. So it's, uh, but I try to link the, the familiar drama with the historical context yeah. to expand, to go beyond this. Mm. Uh, well, yeah. And also because, as you said, uh, for a whole generation, it, it was the destruction of a whole generation in, so, in some way, what, what happened in the 60s and 70s. So you could say the fathers also destroyed something for the, the sons, turned their lives into ashes or, you know. Um, uh, the Guardian, the British newspaper, wrote in its review of this novel, uh, it is partly a sense of waste and destruction that gives this novel its bitterness. Yet the defeat of a generation and its ultimate Moral transcendence also lends it an epic breadth. So um, there was, in a way, a, a destruction of a generation or of a country, but, but there's also the destruction of the old city of Manaus, as you told about the city, as you write in the other novel, the city maiming itself and uh, refusing to acknowledge its past. Uh, and uh, there's uh, the fallacy of progress and, and, and future. Uh, you seem very skeptical about the notions of, of progress and growth and uh, future. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, your motto, the Brazilian uh, Republic's motto is uh, order and progress. Order and progress. Disorder. Disorder. And, uh, but despite yeah. that, I, I, I love Brazil. Mm. <laughs> it's a wonderful people, Brazilians. The problem is our, not all, but a part of our elite. This is a big problem. And, but his time will defeat them, mm. the barbarous. You think so? I think so. I yeah. hope so. Yeah. Elections and people has to be educated. Yeah. You know, a big problem of the it was not only violence, repression, and censorship. The dictatorship they destroyed the public education in Brazil. I studied in public schools, but. It was the, the last generation to study in a good public school. Mm. And after, in the 70s, from the 70s on, the public school was destroyed. So or it was completely yeah. abandoned. You have to get money to get an education. A lot of yeah. money. Yeah. A lot of money. Uh, about $1,000 a month. Mm. To have your, your son, your children, each one mm. in, a, in a private, good private school. Can you imagine $1,000 mm. a month? That's what the elite and the middle class in Sao Paulo and Rio pay for educate their children. And another thing that is very important, when you study in a public school, you know all, all the people, all kind of, of, of people, socially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. different, yeah. yes. the, 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 the social difference. Yeah. The poor, the rich, the, the, the doctor, the lawyer, the working class, they are together. <laughs> this is democracy. Yeah. My children, for example, they don't know they don't have colleagues, black Brazilians, mm. in, 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 in the room. In the, yeah. and this, is, this is segregation. Yes. And, uh, well, this is a disaster. Yeah. A disaster. And you take a lot of time to, to recover. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of time. Perhaps uh, a century. Because in very few years you can destroy what has been built up. Exactly. But it takes a lot it's of time. It's just like to... a war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
you can yeah. see in Europe yes. what happened in a few years yeah. is a disaster. Yeah. So it happened in South America, yeah. in Argentina, for example. It happened the same thing in Chile. And, uh, and well, 25 years with no elections, with no practice, without practicing democracy, mm. what can, can we wait, expect of the politicians? We have we had chance we had we had it was, it was not a bad chance it was almost a miracle, almost a miracle. I don't believe in miracles, but <laughs> but the election of President Fernando Henrique Cardoso, Lula, and this lady Dilma Rousseff were very impressive because it could be much much worse. Mm -hmm much, much worse. And it's true that in the last 20 years, Brazil has conquered some, some social inequalities is down. Mm. So there's a little reason for hope. But, but, there is always but, a but the problem reason for with hope. the elite uh, the elite that is now, who didn't personally destroy, you know, the, the, it's not their fault that the school system doesn't work, for instance, but what is the problem with the elite that you have right now? Don't they, how do you say, there's a, lot of, there's a feeling in, in all your novels about uh, sort of n not wanting to, fleeing where you come from, or, or not acknowledging your past, or not knowing your roots, not knowing, uh, and that sense of disorientation that you talk about, is this a problem, sort of the, the, the elite that, that does not really acknowledge Brazil in a way, or, or how can, can you explain that? It's a mentality that comes from the colonialism. Mm. It's, that is the question, the problem. <laughs> comes from the colonialism, to gain a lot of money without caring with the people, with, this, the, with the city, with the story of the city, with the children. Can you imagine, we have 5,600 uh, cities, municipios, mm -hmm. mayors. Yeah. The mentality of the majority of these people is horrible. They don't care with the children, most of them, with the education of the, the children, of the Brazilian children. No, they they want for them for themselves to come rich in two years or three years, not become rich in a life. <laughs> This is the mentality of, of most, not all, of course. There are good politicians, there are good, good people in power, but most of them, there's a fight, I think, that, you know. I can give you an example, just a, one example. In my city, Manaus, where half of the population lives in a shant town, half, one million inhabitants live in a shanty towns, favelas. Mm. Uh, a former governor built a stadium, football, a football stadium. stadium. Yeah. It costs about uh, $500 million. And there was a stadium, very good stadium, <laughs> for 1,400 people. Yeah. And the new stadium was built for 1,400 people thousand people. Mm. The same. And why they they decide to build this stage? Mm. Uh, Chico Buarque has a song called Criticizing the uh, Tenebrosas trans Transações. Mm. The, Tin, help yeah. me. The, 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 tenebrosas well, the Transações. Tenebrous, the, the, shadowy, the shadowy transactions, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. This is the problem of Latin America. Yeah. 
and this is corruption for... and bad administrations and all all these these Ganeshos. Mm. Uh, it's it's difficult to, and that's why people was protesting. Yeah, in uh, you have heard about the yeah. demonstration. It was not against the president. It was against everything. Mm. <laughs> all this mess, all this kind of all this mentality, and uh, no, but I'm not the president. <laughs> Not at all. We, 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 we should laugh sometimes and be ironic because, you, and you should fight against everything. I work in a NGO. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, in, in the Amazon that works with with the education of children uh, in in a small village in the Amazon, just to build small, very small libraries. We are in a library, but it's very modest. 170 libraries they have built. And children that had never seen a book. And now they are reading and they are, they are happy. They can think in the future somehow. And uh, there are a lot of people working this NGO. Mm. Uh, which is in Sao Paulo, but it's a net and all the legal Amazon region. It's a wonderful work. So we have to do that. Yeah. There, I remember a quotation from the orphans of El Dorado where there's a young man uh, who wants to, or he, I think rather there's a, an older man uh, wanting an old, a young man to become a politician, to stand for a mayor or, or stand for the city council. And the young man says, well, uh, what party should I run for? And the old man says, oh, that doesn't matter. The important thing is that you win. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a mentality. <laughs> and that's what, 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 what we heard. <laughs> yeah. This is the... It's, it's very real, very, very, uh, that's, the, that's the, the big problem, not to think in a collective, collectivity. Uh, it's sad because uh, they have to, the elite has to, to go out with bodyguards. Yeah. Have, they live in, in big house with, just like, uh, Fortress. Yeah, it's not a kind of life. Uh, but things change. History changes. Mm. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> and and will there be a, a sort of progress um, that does not destroy um, a, a growth or a progress or a future that does not destroy the past, does not destroy the beautiful buildings or the rainforest or the lives of peoples and uh, how do you see um, the future? I don't see. Uh, I, I cannot foresee. It's impossible for me. I think about the past and the, and the present time. <laughs> That's my <laughs> to talk about, to write about uh, the past but, but at the same time the past, bring the past to, to to, to our time, mm. because uh, it makes sense if you if you write about the past time, but but uh, how to say only if you talk dialogue with the present. And to understand the present, you should you should understand the past. Yeah. If you don't know anything about colonialism, you can't understand South America. You can't understand this mentality. Why, for example, 90%, uh, all, almost all the, the black people in Brazil, they are, they cannot, they are not doctors, they are not lawyers, they are not, they have bad schools, but since a century ago, the slavery is finished, but, but the Republic, in the very beginning, 
till all the 20th century didn't carry them. Hmm. Yeah, to understand this, why another day my son, my 10 years old son, asked me why all the poor are black? Hmm. How can I answer? <gasps> so a boy, yeah. I should talk about slavery, about the story of the Republic in the 20th, the last century. And this is, this is, uh, history explains a lot of things. Yes, it's difficult to... Even Manaus, the, dec the, the king of the city, when Henry Wickham, <coughs> the mm -hmm. British botanist, uh, Robert Hobo uh, mm -hmm. stole, stole stole the rocks. seeds. Yeah. Thousands of seeds of Amazonian the Amazonian uh, rubber rubber tree. Yeah. Area Brazilians. Yeah. And he planted in, in Kew Garden and then in Asia. And forty, 40 years later the economy of the, the region was was down. This is called bio piratery. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a popular figure in in Brazil. It's hated <laughs> in the schools of the Amazon. The professor of histories, the teacher of histories, the first thing is called, do you know how the Amazon <laughs> <laughs> cracked down? No. So you listen to the history of Henry, Mr. Henry Wickham, <laughs> who was Henry Wickham, a pirate. Mm. So these are the. When you write a novel, you cannot be naive. Never. Unless you write uh, uh, a very, how to say, self help. <laughs> but this is not literature. <laughs> this is another thing. Uh, and actually, what's so beautiful about your novels is also, I think, that, that they're about the power of literature, about the power of art, and also discussing in this novel what is art, what should art be. Um, there's an older artist who is accused of selling out and becoming a, a paintings factory. And there's a young artist who is criticized uh, for not making art. This is just provocation. This is not art. It's nothing. It's provoking. It's, it's not art. So there's a lot about what is art, really, and also the power of literature. In, in the two other novels, um, there are the beautiful passages where, where love is conquered uh, thanks to poems. Uh, in the brothers, uh, there's a person <coughs> reciting Arab uh, ghazals to conquer uh, the love of a, of a young, uh, or to get the love of a young woman. And in the uh, Orphans of uh, El Dorado, there's a... Um, there's, um, Kavafis yeah. poem. Mm -hmm. Kavafis poem. Yeah. Yes. I was inspired by this poem yeah. of Ka Kavafis. Yeah. So, so when you read your novels, you are reminded of... Uh, the power of literature. Yes, because I think that books talk about books. Every, mm -hmm. no, in fact, we, we are trying to to write again the stories that were told some day before, <laughs> and uh, that's why we read the, we read the classics and uh, and there are a lot of Flaubert in my books of <laughs> Stendhal of. Uh, I stole many things. <laughs> I borrowed, in fact. I borrowed a lot of, of, of things. And uh, this is literature. Mm. Uh, it's a kind of uh, renovation of a myth. It's always the myth that, uh, not really a myth, because myth is a, is a response, but myth is the point of, the, of, of departure. Mm. We will open the floor for questions in five minutes, approximately. Um, 
but we decided that we would end by one more passage uh, read from the novel to hear the style of the novel. And uh, I'm re reminded of, uh, there's a French teacher in the other novel, The Brothers, um, who says to his students, well, um, politics is important, but, but politics is for the break. In class, we have higher things to discuss. Uh, and uh, that is literature, <laughs> literature and art. So um, we decided to, to read uh, a passage from, uh, from, from the beginning of the book, from the first third of the book. Um, and we talked about reading it only in Danish, but I'm having second thoughts. And I actually think if you would like to, you should make... No, 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 no. <laughs> no second thoughts. <laughs> no, always stick with... with um, okay. Um, so I'm going to read in Danish. And um, Mundu and Lavu are on a riverboat uh, far out in the jungle. And they meet another boat. Um, they're going with, uh, with, uh, with Mundu's father, who's called Janu, uh, who's a very rich uh, businessman and has good friends and connections in the military. And I should mention also that uh, the person called Macau is uh, the chauffeur and um, yeah, the chauffeur of the of uh, Mundus' father. Chauffeur and the skipper, you, you could say. Længere fremme, der hvor floden var bredest, dukkede tætte skyer op og en tyk tog dækkede flodbrederne og skoven og spærrede for udsynet. Og når den blinde sig læs ned ad rebojade, hørte vi latter lave stemmer og musik. Vi sejlede langsomt i retning af lydene. Inde midt i togen anedes omridset af en enorm mørk og ubevægelig figur. Skibslanternen spottede en grønlig båd med stævnen stående fast på den højre flodbred. Det lykkedes Macau at tyde signalerne fra den anden kaptajn. Det er en båd med motorstop, herr Jarno. Lad os hjælpe den. Det ville chefen ikke. Men Macau blev ved. Det er en pligt at hjælpe, og de vil bare anmelde det til havnefoden, og det vil betyde en bøde, en stor bøde. Jeg betaler bøden, lad os komme afsted, befalede Jarno. Det er vigtige folk. Ejeren af båden er chef for de handlende og en af deres egne venner, og der er ingen af dem, der har motorforstand. Jarno kæmpede endnu lidt imod, gjorde en grimasse og sagde, så læg dog til ved den lorte båd. Der er vel ingen vej udenom. Båden var fyldt med piger og en tre-fire mænd. Jarno ville gemme sig i kahytten, men der var en, der råbte på ham. Mundu genkendte stemmen, det var Oberst Sanda. Han var i strålende humør med et glas i hånden, og han svejede frem og tilbage i takt med dønningerne. Bag ham så man løjtnant Galvus runde ansigt, at judanten var ubevæbnet og blot i en grøn skjorte med et militær emblem på brystet. Mellem de to hængekøjer anede sit furet ansigt med overskæg halvt skjult Herodot. Vores motor er gået i stå, sagde Sandra. Kom herover, Janu, og tag bare sønnen med. Lad os more os lidt. Men værktøjskasse i hånden forsvandt Macau ned i bunden af den havarerede båd. Hans chef lænede sig op af reglingen og så sønnen springe op på dækket op til mændene for at drikke sammen med dem og hænge ud med pigerne. Hende, der stod nærmest Mundu, var i shorts og t-shirt. Hun var mørklødet og ikke ret høj og lå af ingenting ligesom et barn. Hun så ældre ud end de andre med sine velvoksne bryster, og hun var den mest provokerende. Hun drak og vrikkede frem og tilbage foran ham. Hun gav sit glas til en anden. Og nu overværede Jarno den scene, han så længe havde drømt om, sønnen i armene på en pige. De dansede tæt med lukkede øjne, og Mundus hænder kærtegnede pigens nakker og skuldre. Obert Sander løftede sit glas og kaldte på vinden, der afviste med en håndbevægelse. Jarno tog den høje musik med højt humør, også lugten af brændt benzin. Han smilede fjollet til mig, som var jeg hans medsammensvorne, uden at kunne fornemme den vanvittige provokation i søndens beruselse. Macau dukkede op igen med hænderne smurt ind i olie. Han tog sig en sluk øl og afvendrede ordre om afgang. Min ven grinede for sig selv og forlod dinglende pigen for at kaste over den næste, og derefter en til, så han havde en på hver side, mens han pegede på oberstens mave og slog en latter op. 
Løgnant Galvo tog hårdt fat, fat i armen på Mundo. Sådan leger vi altså ikke, min dreng. Luderne kan jo lide det, råbte Mundo og bøvsede ham lige op i ansigtet. Makao og jeg trak ham væk og ned på vores egen båd, mens han brølede luderne i og jeres luder. Det gør ikke noget, sagde Obersen til Jarno. Sådan starter de unge. De lærer at drikke med tiden. Mundo bøjede sig ud over reglingen og kastede op mellem de to både. Sadet savlende strakte han armen ud, rakte en finger i vejret og pegede mod Sanders hoved. Obersen holdt sin oppasser tilbage og sendte Jarno et gennemborende blik. Båden fjernede sig, musikken forstummede, og pigens ansigt så stadig søgende efter Mundus skikkelse. Okay.